Okay. Can you hear me? Okay, so my name is Adam Klein, and this talk is about open source libraries in Angular, both if you want to write them and if you're consuming them, and I think it's just a good general knowledge to, to be aware of. So, as a lot mentioned, I'm Adam Klein, CEO of Fiverr and Tech. And I want to start with a story, and this story is about a uh, library that I wrote. Uh, I used to love building uh, tree views, uh, and I had to build a lot of tree views in uh, applications. And it really bothered me that there is no native tree view component for Angular. Like, there were a lot of jQuery things, but there was nothing that was native Angular. And I'm talking two years ago. Uh, so I looked around, looked around and uh, searched if there's some kind of library, and I saw that there isn't one. So I went on a ski trip with my friends. And it was fun, but there was one problem. I have a torn meniscus. And the torn meniscus, turns out, they don't work well with doing ski. So eventually I ended up uh, skiing like two hours and after coming back to the hotel with excruciating pain, I had a lot of time. So in that time, I started writing the tree component for Angular. And that was the initial commit about uh, more than a little bit more than two years ago. And I knew that I wanted to build something fast I didn't want to build it for like one year and then release it and maybe nobody will use it. So I wanted to see if people use it, what they want from the tree, tree which features, and how it goes. So the important things for me when I built it were to make it customizable because I'm using it one way and people use it another way and I want them to be able to use it whatever way they want. And I want it to be extendable, which means that if I give them options and none of the options fit what they want, they can just do like a custom template or a custom action and do whatever they want. And the other thing was that it's listenable, so you have events, everything that happens in the tree you can react to. You have an API, so everything that the user can click and expand the node in the tree, you can also do programmatically. That was from day one. And it was very important for, to, for me to have some kind of killer feature, something that it takes a lot of time to write yourself. And it will be the main reason for you to use an open source library other than just writing your own tree component. And for me, that was the key, keyboard navigation. Uh, who's, who has tried to implement their own tree view with keyboard navigation? A few people. It's hard. Okay, just think about it. When you press the down arrow, you need to figure out if you're a parent or a child or if it's expanded or collapsed. It's really hard. Thank you. <laughs> so two years later, um, there was a lot of traction to the tree and it was uh, really fun. And these are the statistics of the library as, for, as of now. And you might look and, and uh, say, oh, Stars is a good statistic, right? The more stars you have, people like your uh, library. And issues, maybe issues is bad, right? You have, so first of all, these are not open issues. That these are all the issues that were ever open, okay? Most of them are closed. Uh, but issues is also a good thing. It means that people want more features. The people are trying your uh, component in different ways that you haven't thought of. And Quite frankly, like 80% of the issues are just people not knowing how to use the, um, the library or they have a bug in their own code, but still. And forks, forks is also, sounds like, oh, if people fork your library, it means that it didn't really fit their needs. So maybe it's not good. But in fact, it's good. That's the whole essence of open source, right? If you have, uh, the source is open, right? Open source. You don't have to rewrite it from scratch. You can start from something. And if it doesn't exactly fit your needs, you fork it and you uh, continue. And it also means that um, 
that my code is readable so people can fork it and continue. What about pull requests? Who's, who asked? What's the question? 81 pull requests. So uh, pull requests is obviously a very good thing because it means the community is giving back. Like it's not just it's not just something I wrote and that's it. People are adding code and I um, approve this code. So now I already have a lot of other features like async data, drag and drop, filtering, virtual scroll. You can display 100,000 nodes, integration tests, and more. If you want to find out about this library, just Google Angular Tree Component. I also have another library I wrote. It connects Mobix to Angular. Uh, it, and it's now part of the official uh, Mobix organization. So you can also uh, go there. So a little bit about writing open source. If you want to write an open source library, first thing you should do is research. You don't want to contaminate the jungle of open source, right? If there, are, if there were already five different uh, tree components for Angular, I wouldn't write another one. So first do your research and make sure you know that writing open source is not just about writing code. So if you're going to do it, be prepared that uh, you're going to have to write tests, documentations, support the community. Uh, so take that into account. And of course, it comes with responsibility because companies actually rely on these libraries for their production apps. So if you just start doing it, think that it's something more long term. Not, OK, I wrote it, people use it, and um, now I don't want to write it anymore. It's for individuals and companies as well. Some companies uh, write open source, and then they let it go. So let's get a bit more technical about building a library, and it's it will also be useful for you if you're using libraries. So when you build an app, it's easy, right? How do you create a new app in Angular? Nginew, right? It's easy. When I started, there was no such, such thing for libraries. And libraries are much more complex to build. Why? Because when you build your app, you know how you want to build it. You bundle it, let's say, with Webpack. You choose which uh, specific Angular version you're using. And that's it. That's your build process. When you're building a library, you have to support other build systems. You have to support many versions of Angular. So the build process is much more complex. So I had to write my own custom build. Uh, if you want to find out, you can. this is the blog post that I followed. Uh, it's a very good blog post by uh, uh, Minko Gechev. In Angular 6, you actually have a generator. If you download Angular, the new Angular CLI, you can do ng-generate and then the name of the library. And it will uh, generate the library for you. It's based on ng-packager. I still didn't migrate my library to this because I'm waiting for it to be a little more stable, a few more features, and then I'll do the migration. OK, so let's dive a little deeper. What happens when you import something from my library? So there are two processes that actually happen independently. One is that TypeScript needs to figure out what is this tree model. Is it a class? Is it a function? What properties does it have on it? Uh, that's how it compiles your code when you're using the tree model. And it can tell you tree model is, doesn't have this and this property. Another process that happens in, uh, independently is your bundling my library with your application, for example, using Webpack. And Webpack needs the actual source code of the, in order to bundle it together with your app. So if this was a file from your application, then these two are the same file. It's a TS file with type definitions. It gets compiled to, to JavaScript, and then it gets consumed by Webpack. But when you're using a library, it's different. Because a library, when you build a library, you create a distribution and you already compile the TypeScript to JavaScript. Which means that you don't have the TS files. The dis distribution of the library only has the compiled source code. So what we have to do in order to support TypeScript is we have to tell TypeScript to generate files that are called 
DTS. Who knows what DTS files are? Okay. So there are definition files if you've used C or C++ before. These are basically like header files. They're not the actual source code, but they say everything about the types. So TypeScript is using these generated DTS files. Type, uh, TypeScript generates these files for us. We don't have to write them manually. And Webpack is using the JavaScript files. That's how it works. But there's another process involved. Who doesn't know what AOT is? AOT is a head of time compilation. So in Angular, we have the compiler that compiles our components and templates before we ship them with our application. So when you're doing AOT for your application, it's easy. You run ng-build uh, minus minus AOT, and the AOT compiler will uh, compile your templates. But when you're using an open source library, one mistake that I made in the beginning was I thought, OK, I need to pre-compile using the Angular compiler. I need to pre-compile my components of the tree component. And that's not uh, true. That's a mistake, because uh, everything has to be compiled using the specific Angular version of your application. So I can't pre-compile the components. So I don't know if you know if you knew this, but when you run ng-build minus minus AOT, you're actually running the Angular compiler on your uh, third-party dependencies as well. And if they don't support AOT, then AOT will fail. So if you write a library, or if you're using a library, it has, and you want to use AOT, and you want to use, then it has to support AOT. So how do you support it? Um, so basically, you, instead of running TSC, you run NGC, which is the Angular compiler. Okay, TSC is TypeScript. And you give it some flag, and then it generates files called metadata JSON. Why do we need those files? Because as we said, T TypeScript looks at the DTS files and the Angular compiler as well. But these files, they don't have the metadata needed for the Angular compiler about the decorators of our component. So after we run NGC, we have the J JS file, the DTS file, and now we also have the metadata JSON files for the Angular compiler. Now, if you listen to Rob's talk, he said that in future versions of Angular, we won't need to support this anymore because everything will be together in the same file. So in future versions of Angular, 7 maybe, um, these metadata uh, definitions will be inside the DTS files. Uh, but now, as of now, we have to use the metadata JSON. And this is still not enough, because if you're just using the, you don't, need, you don't really need to bundle your library, because it gets bundled with the application. Sometimes you do need to bundle it, because you want to include it in some kind of JS fiddle or plunker. And it needs to be just one file. Like, this file is Angular tree component. Um, people who use system.js, I've heard that these people exist. I haven't met them, but then they need the Angular, uh, the library to be bundled to a single file. Uh, so a few things to know. You can do this with Webpack. There's also another tool that's very dedicated to this purpose called Rollup. It's much simpler, and it does everything that you need to do. So basically, it bundles all your uh, compiled code together. Uh, you do need to bundle your vendors and third party that you're using. So for example, I'm using Lodash. So Lodash is bundled together with uh, the tree component. So, if you're, uh, so it makes it a little bit bigger than it really is. Um, but we have tree shaking, which Rob also mentioned. You have it both in Rollup and uh, Webpack. And uh, so basically what it does tree shaking, imagine you shake a tree and some leaves fall. So it's the same thing with code. It just leaves the code that you're actually using. So if I'm using three functions from Lodash in my tree component, then the final bundle will only include this function, will not include the entire Lodash uh, library. And last thing, UMD 
if you know a bit about uh, modules in JavaScript, you have uh, CommonJS, AMD, ES module, modules. Uh, there is one uh, thing that you have to remember, which is UMD. UMD is a universal module definition, and it supports all of these uh, types of module systems. And Rollup knows how to in output this file. So after all of this process, you take, Rollup takes the JavaScript files that we compile, bundles everything together to a single file, and that's the UMD bundle. Whew. OK. That's a long process, and that's a lot of things to know. Um, so fortunately for you, if you're going to start a library now, ng generate library should do all those things for you. You don't need to know anything about it. But I think it's always good to know what's going on under the hood. Semver, who knows what Semver is? You should know what Semver is even if you don't develop open source libraries. It's a short for semantic versioning. And basically, it's, it's just a convention uh, for how do we bump our versions. So we have, let's say, uh, version 1.3.1. So 1 is the major version. 3 is the minor version. Thank you. You're alive. And the last one is the patch. So we have min major minor patch. And the convention is when do you bump, where do you, when do you increase each version? So major version is only when you do breaking changes. For example, Angular 1 to Angular 2, or Angular 2 to Angular 4. Minor version is when you add new features, you change the API, but you don't break anything. For example, you add a function, uh, you add another par parameter, but it's, it has a default value, maybe. And the patch version is just for bug fixes, refactoring, something that doesn't really change the API. And now comes, this is, prob by the way, from our first uh, Angular app t-shirt. Uh, when we had breaking changes between release candidates, it's no longer the situation, but it's always good to have uh, self-humor. So what is a breaking change? Some things, it's pretty obvious. Like if I rename a component or a function, it's breaking change, right? Uh, basically, a breaking change is a change that if you get the new version, your application will, might break. It will not necessarily break, it might break. Some things are more subtle. For example, if I don't change the API of a function, but I change its behavior, is that a breaking change? What do you think? Yes, because I didn't change the API, but if somebody will get the new version, the application might break because I, I changed the behavior. If I change the default value of a parameter, let's say I have use animation. And the default value used to be true. And now I change the default value to false. So now suddenly somebody used my uh, component and they had animations when they expand collapse the tree and now they don't. So it's a breaking change. OK, so knowing what's a breaking change and how to increase the versions is important. But you don't want to increase major versions every time you want to make a change because people would just go crazy because every time they want new features or bug fixes, they have to change how they use your library. So this is important. Uh, and you see Angular is also treating this uh, with respect. They say, you have half a year where we don't do any breaking change. And every half a year, we release another major version. And it's also not like a huge change. So how do you keep backwards compatibility? You deprecate things. So if I want to. Uh, rename, uh, let's say, an option. I don't rename it, because that's a breaking change. I add another option with the new name. And I deprecate the old one, which means that if you, if you use the old one, it will still work. But you'll get a nice warning in the console saying, this is deprecated. Please use the new uh, name. So nothing breaks. You can do it uh, relaxed. and uh, and next major version or the one afterwards, uh, I will remove all the deprecated uh, functions. OK. Uh, it's also important to version your documentations, because people look at the docs and they see, 
oh, this is a really cool feature, but they are using an older version. And then they open an issue. I tried this, and it doesn't work. So if you version your documentation, they will still do it. But then you can tell them, listen, here are the docs for the version that you're using. Please read uh, the docs of the correct version. I'm using readme.io, which is a nice tool. It lets you version everything. And uh, one last thing about versioning is to uh, maintain a change log. And if you're using libraries, usually they have this changelog MD file. It's very good to know about it, because then when you're migrating from one version to the other, uh, you can see what the changes are. And you also, I also highlight which are the breaking changes. OK. So I'm actually ahead of time, so I'll speak slowly. OK, so a few do's and don'ts about consuming open source. Um, it's pretty simple, but I see some misconceptions. And I think it's things that are good to know. So first of all, when you open an issue, like, don't be too quick. Say like, oh, it doesn't work. Let's open an issue. Okay? Because issues, they take time for people to answer. And also, don't be too slow to open an issue. Like, sometimes you're uh, spending like two weeks exploring why, why doesn't it work. Like, maybe someone from the community or the author can help you. So find the balance. So when you, when you do uh, open an issue, uh, first look for an existing one, a closed one. Maybe somebody already solved this for you. It will, be, it will be faster for you. It's not just for the library maintainer. Um, I mean, you can, you can probably feel my pain when I'm going through the slides. Like, uh, oh, this is a duplicate issue again. But it's not just for me. It's also you can find the solution much quicker. Sometimes there are other channels. For example, I, opened, I recently opened a Slack channel, so people can ask other people from the community. It's much faster, like you get a notification. Somebody asks a question, you answer. You don't have to go through the flow of opening an issue. And, and you get a response from whoever wants to help you. You can also use Stack Overflow for these things. If you want to be really nice when you open an issue, you put a link to, let's say, working version of, of your, the bug you're reporting, uh, either using a Plunker or JS Fiddle or something like that. What? Stack Blitz. Stack Blitz is awesome. Uh, it used to not work for like a short period of time, but now I think it's OK. Um, I actually, in the issue template, I have a link to a Plunker uh, with the Angular Tree component already loaded, so you can just like fiddle with the options and uh, reproduce your bug. And if you want to be really nice, then you help debug the issue. I mean, it's open source. You have the source code. It's a beautiful open source. Uh, you can debug it yourself, not because you're nice. I mean, I guess you're nice, but not because of this. It's just faster. Like, if you find out where the bug is and you open an issue and say, I have a, an issue. I found where the bug is. You just need to change this field. It will be solved quicker. And you can also, like, the next step is to open a pull request. So pull requests. Um, first of all, if you want to open a, a pull request, and that's great, make sure you co coordinate it with the library ma maintainers. Because maybe it's not in their roadmap. Maybe they don't want to include this feature. Maybe they're already working on it, and they want to do it differently. So if you want to do a pull request, that's amazing. Just uh, um, open maybe an empty pull request and say, I want to change this and this. Uh, I want to do it this way. Is it OK? And if you get a green light, go ahead and do it. And. Doing a pull request is better than forking. You can fork the library uh, if you need something different. And I know some libraries, it's very hard to do a pull request. They don't accept them. Uh, they require like very specific things. And you have to write tests. And people sometimes look at it as like, it's going to take me like uh, one week just to get this pull request uh, written and one month to get it accepted. 
it's it's not always the case. I, I guess like for Angular, it's hard to get a pull request in. But for regular components, I had, before I started writing my own libraries, I had pull requests got accepted really quickly. Uh, you change small things, you update the tests, it's like two hours and you become an open source contributor. Okay, so there are rewards for writing open source. Um, as I said, a lot of res responsibility and some headache, but a lot of rewards. Uh, people write some nice words to you. They say, thanks, like your library saved my life. Um, I quit my job and I ran away with your library to an island. So I left my wife. I mean, uh, yeah. So it's really nice to know that you you're actually created something of your own that help companies build better software. It's, it's an amazing uh, feeling for me. It's also good for your resume, like to say, I'm an open source contributor. Um, I'm not sure it's worth the time just for the resume. So if you don't enjoy it, you probably shouldn't do it. And if you want to like join as a contributor to Angular 3 component, if you're using it yourself and you want to improve it, I'm always welcome to, to accept new contributors. And now for some shameless promotions. So we are 500 Tech. Uh, we help companies build advanced web, mobile, and blockchain applications. Uh, so what we do is basically, if you have, if you don't have enough knowledge or uh, or uh, manpower or woman power, uh, doing front-end development, we can help you either by building the infrastructure for you, doing remote work with your team or just consulting, code reviews, and the training. We also do fun things like uh, we build like really cool projects. We have a lot of clients. We like doing these things, like this conference, meetups. Uh, we write books. We write open source. We do a lot of cool stuff. And if there's anything you want to say, just click here. Go to our website. And if there's anybody who you think might want to get to know us and what we do, uh, write here, hey, Adam, I really liked your talk. You're an amazing guy. And here's an email of somebody I know that might uh, want to get to know you. And now I think I have two minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, the question is, do I have insights about licensing? Um, usually it's MIT. Uh, you should be aware of third party. So if you're using MIT and you have a dependency which is not MIT. So basically MIT is free for use and, re and modification. BSD is also good. Oops. Yeah. GPL is less common, but yeah, I th I'm not... 100% sure what the differences are, but the most common ones are BSD and MIT, which are they're pretty much the same. And don't have a patent clause. <laughs> yes. So the question was, how did I promote the library? And the answer is, I didn't. So basically, there was nothing, there was no other alternative. So that's, that's why I wrote it. So I, I wouldn't write one now. Or actually, I think now Material has a tree library of their own. It's probably almost as good as mine, but uh, like if you want custom CSS, you'll probably use mine or a better performance. S okay, in material. So use material, I don't care. Uh, so the answer was uh, I, I didn't promote it. Like people look for Angular tree view or tree component and they found, uh, but I did have a lot of features like right away, like enough features. More questions? Oh, I'm out of time. Uh, so thank you very much.